Sometimes my mother used to say to me, oh, Greg, don't be so dramatic. I don't know if she really had a basis for saying that or not. I suspect she did. How many of you have said that to your children? Okay, a fair number of you. And yet, amazingly enough, God sometimes chooses to speak in really dramatic ways. It helps get our attention somehow. He's also really good at taking very dramatic incidences and stories and helping them morph and evolve into something that continues to hold meaning. The vessel moves forward, added to, as it were, without necessarily being emptied. You know the story of the Exodus, at least I think most of you do. I hope you do. A fellow by the name of Moses called by God to lead God's people out of Egypt where they had become slaved and served as slaves for centuries to a land that God would show them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of their ancestors, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would be restored not only to the land, but to the worship of of the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, you know that Moses went before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was not keen on the idea of losing his labor force. Some of you may recall the movie that came out, uh, and I mean nothing ethnically by this at all, but there was a movie that came out uh, 12 years or so called A Day Without a Mexican. And it socially looked at what would happen to the state of California without migrant workers. And literally everything would fall apart. Your restaurants wouldn't be open, your crops wouldn't be harvested, your homes wouldn't be cleaned. And again, I, I'm not trying to pigeonhole or stereotype, I'm going back to the premise of the film. Because four decades now we have uh, had banter in this state and in this country about the problem posed by immigration, and there are challenges there, real challenges. But imagine losing your labor force. Pharaoh wasn't keen on the idea. He wasn't interested in having this group of people exit and go do their own thing. So Moses had to come to him, not once, not twice, not thrice, but through multiple visits with multiple plagues. Each time it got worse until the dreaded final plague came, and it was awful. Pharaoh had refused to listen to anything. Crops had been destroyed by bugs and hail. Nile had turned to blood. Frogs had crawled out of the Nile River and overrun everything. It was, Egypt was a mess economically. It was a mess physically, and it was in dire danger of losing uh, part of its population to starvation because so much havoc had been wreaked among the crops and so forth. But Pharaoh had not listened, and so now it came time to make it personal. The firstborn of Egypt was going to die from the cattle in the field to the poorest of the poor to Pharaoh's household itself. angel of death, as it's referred to, would fly over Egypt, and in the morning, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth would be heard. God did tell Moses that there was a out, an out, that if the people of Israel would follow his orders and do what he asked, they would be spared. They were to take a lamb and slaughter it, They were to take the blood of the lamb which had been drained and they were to put it with hyssop branches on the doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they slept. So that when the angel passed by, or this being of death passed by, they would not go into that house and not take the life of the firstborn of that home. They were to cook the lamb in a particular way There's always specific instructions about how the fat was to be handled and the organs. In this case, it was to be cooked whole. They were to eat it standing up with their 
tunics on and their belts tied. They were to have their staves at hand. They were to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. They were to prepare everything with bitter herbs and spices so that they could, rem they could be reminded in that moment of the bitterness of slavery from which they were about to be delivered. Everything happened. And they were to make bread, but not wait for it to rise. They weren't to use yeast at all, in fact. They were simply to make the bread, you know, water, oil, flour, toast it, and eat it with the lamb. Now, we don't have the Passover feast today. In fact, many Adventists would object, hey, wait a minute, I'm a vegetarian. But the Passover feast became an institution in Israel. This was the text we read in Leviticus. Here are my, my Sabbaths, my feasts, my days that you're to remember. There's the weekly Sabbath, yes, and also the Passover. And there were more that were mentioned. So the Passover stands there, and through time it's celebrated. We find, you know, if you, if you just plug it into Bible Gateway, you'll find the Passover mentioned over and over and over and over and over again. It features in Jesus' life in a couple of places. Toward the beginning of, of his time of awareness about who he was in relationship to his heavenly father. And it features again toward the end of his life. In usual style, the drama is it's expanded by what we're asked to do in the story. Not only does the firstborn get spared through this sacrifice in which we're painting blood on the doorpost and lintel. But we're to be prepared for a journey. We're not even to leaven the bread. And it's interesting how that becomes a feast all of its own. Instead of having uh, unleavened bread for a particular night or a season once a year, it was to be seven days of no unleavened bread, uh, no leavened bread. And so it became the feast of unleavened bread. And that had a life of its own. In the very ordinary, in the very common, in food that we eat, in the drink that we drink, became encapsulated and symbolized the freedom that would become a nation's and the deliverance from death, the death of all firstborn. So embedded in these simple things became something very profound. In the lamb, Sacrifice that they might have food, yes, but more importantly, that the blood might deliver them from death and in the bread, that they might eat unleavened bread in remembrance of their readiness to go to the place God was calling them to go. So we have this very dramatic picture, this very dramatic moment, and it goes immediately into our New Testament reading. It goes over to 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul spiritualizes it in an interesting way. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, who is our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and weak wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Notice how an old story, high drama, has been reframed. Now we have Jesus, the Lamb of God, who's taken away the sin of the world once for all. Now Jesus has become the sacrifice. Jesus is the one that Paul focuses on. And rather than the unleavened bread itself being the key or the focus, the analogy shifts from the, the peace itself, the bread itself, to something deeper. Don't let the leaven of wickedness and malice, of hatred and wrongdoing, enter your lives. A little goes a long way and permeates a whole loaf. Instead, make new bread with no leaven, that your communities might be the way God ordained them to be that your relationships might be the way God ordained them to be, that your lives might be lived the way God ordained them to be. Bread becomes the symbol of a different kind of life. And then we get to our gospel story. Jesus actually with the disciples in the upper room, which is relevant for us now. It's a Passover scene once again in Mark. This will be Jesus' last Passover. 
And on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, at least at that time, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to make preparations? Jesus gives them this sign, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. I want to pause there quickly because I want to point out how unusual it is that a man would be carrying a jar of water. Where in Scripture, where else in Scripture do you find a man carrying a jar of water? The only thing I can think of, and it may may not be gender specific, is that the miracle at Cana, Christ told his mother, or his mother actually, ordered the servants, we don't know whether they were male or female, to bring jars of water to Jesus that he might do his, his, his work. That would be about the only time I can think of in Scripture where men are carrying water. This was a woman's job. So it's very unusual that we would see this in Scripture. A man carrying a jar of water, it was a sign. You see, Jesus had embedded in that jar of water something very important for himself as a sign as well. Not only was he the one capable of transforming water into something so much grander, into good wine, but Jesus was the water of life, the spring that once drunk from never left you thirsty again. I have water. I have a source, Jesus says to the woman at the well, that if you'll drink of it, you will never be thirsty again. And she's thinking, oh boy, wouldn't it be nice not to have to carry water? And Jesus doesn't mean that. He's talking about something much more spiritual. So here in this moment, the disciples are given a sign, a man carrying water and all that's embedded in that. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Seems pretty direct, doesn't it? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready to make preparations for us there. So the disciples left, went into the city, found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and while they were reclining at the table, he said, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Hear the symbol now of God's deliverance has become perverted, hasn't it? There's the Passover lamb, yes, they're eating it. But there's also the unleavened bread. And the one who dips bread in the cup, this symbol that Paul appropriates and says, no, we don't want any bad yeast going into this, and appropriates it spiritually, but that Leviticus expands to a full week of ceremony. We're going to remember our readiness to go to a new place that God will show us. We're not going to wait for leaven to raise the bread. We're going to eat it with no no leaven at all. Now at the table, the drama is heightened. The one who dips this bread, this sacred bread, this festival of bread, this bread symbolic of the place that they're going to, of the urgency of it all, of God's imminent deliverance, is a betrayer. Can you imagine the heightened sense at the table of what's going on here? Immediately, everybody gets cranky, tense. Something really different has happened in the meal that isn't customary, it isn't good, it isn't happy. They start stewing on this. They were saddened, it says, and one by one they said, Not I, it is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he hadn't been born. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to to his disciples, and he said something else that was really, really weird. He said, Take it. This is my body. And he took from the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank from it. And he said, This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. A promise. This is Mark's version of the Last Supper. 
In the midst of betrayal, the symbol of, of the one betraying is also now the symbol of the body, which will be broken in a few hours. A new symbol for the Christian community. You see, we have no longer the Passover lamb. The lamb has been sacrificed once for all, but the unleavened bread continues to us in time. A symbol of the possibility of betrayal, a symbol of the possibility of bad yeast getting into the bread and spoiling the community. And finally in this, the most important thing of all, the very body of Christ. Not the flesh, no. We don't believe that we're eating Jesus. We're not cannibalistic. But we do believe that this symbolizes the bread. Jesus has said, here's some bread. It's my body. Eat. Partake. Join with me in the place that I'm going to take you. It's high drama. And we get to participate. Today, we're going to take a few minutes. We don't need to be long about this. Pick a partner, I beg you. Exit through the doors. We have in the bulletin the space where men alone can meet, women alone can meet, and families are welcome to serve one another. At this time, I would dismiss you and invite you to come back. Please do not sit in a row marked reserved when you return. Thank you very much.